Um, don't tell anybody because you're actually not supposed to transport them since they are pretty invasive. So that was, uh, that's probably the most illegal thing I've done in my life, but hey, all for a good cause, right? Hey everyone, welcome to the College Lead YouTube channel. My name is Kristen and I'm here to help you perfect your college application process. Today we have a very special guest, Ayushi. She is a graduate of Princeton University and she graduated from Princeton with a degree in computer science. Right now she works in product at a startup called Nines and yeah, Ayushi, could you share a little bit more about yourself? Hey everyone, my name is Ayushi and thanks so much for having me today, Kristen. As you mentioned, I graduated from Princeton University in 2020, and I studied computer science and accidentally got a certificate in cognitive science. Basically, I just class took classes that I loved, and yeah, it turns out you can get a certificate doing that. But I was definitely a little more intentional in the other paths that I pursued through college. So I spent a lot of my time on campus being very involved with the entrepreneurship scene. I co-founded WellPower, which is an Uber for clean water. I also led Princeton's Entrepreneurship Club. And so that gave me a really great opportunity to both, you know, network and talk with administrators to better understand like what's the school strategy when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation, as well as expand opportunities for students who kind of like me as a freshman in high school were like, I really want to get involved in entrepreneurship, but I don't know how. So that's really what I spent my time on campus doing. And then professionally, I um, interned at Microsoft for two summers doing product management and software engineering. I think it's incredible how there's this common theme in your background of starting something of your own, particularly in entrepreneurship now. But I know in a previous conversation, you mentioned that you worked on a quite fascinating independent research project that you started on your own. Could you introduce that to us? Absolutely. So my baby in high school was a independent science project um, where I studied zebra mussels. So for those of you out there who aren't aware of zebra mussels, they are an invasive species of freshwater mussels. And they plague a lot of rivers in the United States, especially mine. So home for me is Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have a lovely river that runs through the heart of the city. I grew up driving over a bridge every day to school. But under the water, these mussels, because they're invasive, um, they actually are terrible for the local environment, for local species. And so current, like currently, or maybe at the time, I should say, the only way that they were really sort of like addressed was dumping a bunch of chemicals in the water to kill them. It's not sustainable. It's really bad for other animals, including these mussels. And so I thought, is there a different sort of solution there? So fast forward, um, I guess the sort of part that I focused on was the zebra mussels that actually clog hydroelectric power plants, pipes. And so TVA is really big in Chattanooga. They do a lot of like hydroelectric power. I think that's great alternative energy sources, but the water pipes that they use to like basically power all of that were actually getting clogged because these muscles secrete um, this kind of like collagen um, kind of like mucusy, but then it like is really sticky. It's, it's actually fascinating how it's going to be. <laughs> and so they secrete that and they basically clamp all on top of each other, um, all trying to get like basically nutrients and water, but that means they like basically clog the whole thing. So super painful process. So what I thought is, hmm, there are some national spe species, right? Such as sharks who have like patterned skin and that prohibits bacteria from growing. Obviously bacteria, zebra mussels are on a very different scale, but could I apply that same concept? So this came about in one of my marine biology classes I took as an elective, like literally just for fun, because I like had an extra period as a sophomore in high school. And that's where I learned about all of these animals, sharks. And then I think there was like a moment where I was sitting in class and I was like, whoa, could those two things come together in, in, like a, in a way that no one's tried before? So what I did about it was I um, basically designed and 3D printed a bunch of different um, surfaces. So different designs from like shark skin patterns to fish scales patterns to like having, of course, you know, your variable just like having a plain surface um, and had a bunch of different iterations and basically uh, went out into the Tennessee River and got a bunch of these mussels and did science experiments with them for about three years. Um, don't tell anybody because you're actually not supposed to transport them since they are pretty invasive. So that was, uh, that's probably the most illegal thing I've done in my life. But hey, all for a good cause, right? Um, but yeah, Kristen, so that's like some background to sort of how I came up with the idea um, and sort of what the actual research question was. 
That is an amazing project. And I love how you were very scrappy and even going there to pick up the muscles, running your own project, combining and creating new solutions based on what you've learned at the time and being really innovative about that. I think that's all really incredible. I'm so curious though, how did you hear about zebra muscles in the first place? I feel like that is quite a niche topic. It definitely is a niche topic. And it's one that really took me just being super immersed in my like local community. So throughout high school, I actually volunteered every summer at our local Tennessee Aquarium. And so through that and through like doing educational programs there and like teaching that, then also just like volunteering, like you hear about what plagues the community because that aquarium not only did a lot of like educational things for people in the city, but a lot of like conservation work um, and like the river and areas around. So that's actually how I learned about zebra mussels. Um, and then, of course, learning more about like the, the biomechanisms in the marine biology class. But yeah, it all started because honestly, I went to summer camp at the aquarium as a kid and was like, oh, I really enjoyed that. I'll go back and volunteer there um, is how it all started, really. That's amazing. How, so how did you go from a volunteer opportunity to a whole research project? I feel like that transition is often one that maybe many students don't make or don't know how to make that transition. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. So. If you took a cynic, like an old grandpa, and you took an optimist, I'm like that kind of person. And so I love I, all the optimists, like here are all the opportunities in the world, but also kind of cynical about like, yeah, there are problems in the world, right? And so I think in my a volunteer opportunity, I took that as a way to just like learn a ton about like what's going on with all things marine biology, what's going on with, you know, all things um, Chattanooga. And then I think once you are able to, at that point, have a very wide breadth of like experiences and also to like learn from experts, right? And that's what's kind of fun about volunteering. People who like spend their time doing this for free, like really like it. And so you just kind of pick their brain, like, hey, what's hard about this? Like what's really plaguing you? And from there, that's where I identified, oh, zebra mussels are problematic. And then I thought, okay, it's obviously not just the conservation part of it. Who else cares about this? And so that's when I just like did a lot of digging, talked to like anyone I could. I My cold email skills back then were just abominable, but somehow people responded. Um, and so, I mean, then I just like did all the research I could and basically followed the experts. So I went and talked to people about TVA. I literally, um, <laughs> when we did college towards my junior year of college, um, had actually reached out to some people at MIT who I like read their paper about zebra mussels and was like, can I come meet you? I'm like, I mean, honestly, it was more of like a fangirl moment than I like actually changed the way in which I like did my research. But I just bring this up to say like, from taking that like, volunteer experience where you get a lot of breadth of information, figuring out where there are pain points, which ones are interesting to you, and then being like, okay, who are the other experts who have had an opinion about this? Um, and then go talk to them. And then from there, I think you have to develop your own hypothesis, right? Like for me, I think the, the moment where I really made that connection between like just learning about this and having my own independent hypothesis was taking a class where I learned about, wow, well, sharks, you know, prevent bacteria from growing on them because of they're like really sandpapery and like the different patterns in their shark skin and just thinking wait can those two things come together that's really the moment when it happened and then you mentioned that this was an independent research project so it's not like it was a structured internship or you were working in someone else's lab so how did you expand and grow your project to know which direction to take it to yeah that's it that's really point. so um actually my junior year was sort of like year two of this and uh, my marine biology professor or teacher, I guess, as they say in high school, had been really helpful sophomore year. But um, then the AP biology teacher at my school was also the chair of the science department. So that's who I went to. And it's crazy, Kristen. I never took AP bio. So I felt kind of awkward. I was Wait, like, really? No way. <laughs> I never took bio because I was on the engineering track. Like, I think uh, the, like, of course, the marine biology part of this was important to me, but I really, really liked like coding up and 3D printing um, and like these pipeliners and to think about, OK, going from a flat surfaces to curved and like all like the fluid dynamics. Like that was probably the most interesting part of this, right, because I was focusing on how do I prevent them from attaching and all the physics behind that. Anyways, so I take physics and chemistry in my junior and senior year. And I didn't take AP bio and I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my God, like I'm not taking her class. And like, it just can't fit into my schedule. And so I was very nervous that I just went to her and just was like, honest, I was like, hey, I really like studying this. I know I'm not in your class, but I was wondering if you would like still be my mentor. And she was like really lovely and so nice. And we got really close to that, even though we never took her class. 
Um, <laughs> so that's really, I, I personally think at that point in my life, because I'd never really done anything so independent um, and so rigorous when it comes to the scientific method, I found that having someone to bounce ideas off of was really important. And I think she did a really good job of not telling me what to do. I think there are a lot of really fantastic research opportunities out there. You know, I've had friends who study molecular biology at Princeton and they, you know, I think in high school did stuff like Sun Kettering. And that's, I think, a very like different sort of handholding and sort of direction than like you just go into your science fair, excuse me, you just go into your science teacher and be like, hey, I want to like apply to a science fair. Um, you know, would you be my sponsor? Would you help? Would you help mentor me? So different conversations, different roles. I personally like the one where I get to, <laughs> sounds terrible, but I like roles where I like, I get to decide what I want to do. And I, I seek out mentorship and seek out advice rather than someone telling me what to build. But I think a lot of people, you know, are different and like want more structure. So there are many different kinds of research opportunities out there. It really depends on how much hand holding do you want? Is this your first time? And also like what resources, right? Like I could be scrappy with, you know, zebra muscles. My school had a 3D printer. Um, I could just like <laughs> get my parents to drive me and like throw these muscles in an igloo, right? Um, but some things like, yeah, if you're interested maybe in like, I don't know, therapeutics and cancer research, that's like a little hard to do just in the basement of your like science building. So I think it also depends on what kind of problem really interests you at the time. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I like the idea of how you say, what kind of learning suits you the, bo the most? Like to identify that, are you more of a self-starter person or are you someone who really wants that more direct mentorship with like uh, who direct you where to go essentially versus you creating your own path? Um, you did mention the science fair, so I'm curious to hear what that experience was like, because it sounds like the whole culmination of your, your research project. Wow, I had such a positive experience with these science fairs. I um, would love to start my own one day. I think on the personal level, right, like it was one a way to sort of showcase and get really good feedback from experts from around, it depends, again, some of them were around the country, some of them were obviously like international science fairs. It was so great to just get feedback on my my ideas and like my process and my takeaways. Um, I think that's huge. I think you know, at least for me, growing up in the same city, my whole life from like age zero to eighteen, it was so good to have an external experience, um, an external person really give that like worldly and cosmopolitan just like feedback and kind of tear you apart with hard questions. I think that was great. <laughs> I think it was so necessary to make like an even better science project, right? Um, so that was one thing, but most importantly, going to science fairs um, introduced me to like amazing, talented go getter people who were so inspiring. Um, and it wasn't necessarily in a like, oh, they're doing this, like I need to do it, not in a competitive way, but truly an inspiring way to think, wow, people have really self started. People have found stuff that they care a lot about, and they found like very unique and innovative ways to solve it. Or I never would have thought about that way of approaching said problem. Um, and so to get inspired for your own work, as well as just to meet amazing people. Um, I think going to those science fairs is when I realized I was like, wow, like, I love growing up in town in Tennessee. But man, there are so many people doing such crazy things. And I want to go be like, be go and meet more of them. Because I think growing up my high school experience was like, I surrounded by the most like, lovely people who just worked really hard. But the sort of ambition to like, really go outside the box was not something I think I encountered a ton until I went to science fairs. I mean, it's like that definition of a science fair, right? You have to be doing something novel, otherwise you wouldn't even be invited. Um, so I could not recommend that experience more highly to one, get really good feedback on your work, but two, to meet other like-minded go-getters um, and just get super inspired by that. I know that you also shared with me separately that you wrote about your research project in your college essay. So obviously there's so, so many stories that you could write about um, in that experience. So how did you pick what to write about um, specific to your research project and also the message that you wanted to convey in your essay? First part was straightforward. The second part was so confusing. So because zebra muscles were kind of like my thing, right? In high school, I was like, I have to reach 
we write about it. And I think one of the questions is something along the lines of a question you've set out to solve. And I was like, yes, this is a question I've set out to solve. Like by definition, there could not be a more perfect um, prompt and essay combination, right? So that was, that was easy. I was like, I love Zayden Russells. I'm gonna write about them in some way. But I think where my high school self really struggled with is I had written for three years, right? About the what, right? Or about the how, not about the why. And so done a lot of soul searching and thinking. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there to like, how do you be reflective? But what I kind of came across was, so zebra muscles have taught me great things. They've taught me how to be resilient. You know, like you got to go get those, those muscles yourself. You got to be scrappy. When a lot of people tell you that it's not worth it because they're invasive species, don't do it. Like if you have that conviction, then you should do it, right? A lot of resilience, a lot of creativity, right? Like most people just dump chemicals in. 3D printing pipeliners, very different. No one's ever done that before. So thinking about how you can take problems that exist in the world and like find creative solutions, that's something that like this, you know, this taught me. Um, and then finally advocating for yourself and your work and being able to show the world like what I'm doing is important and meaningful. Um, I think is actually a really important skill to learn early on because I think you always have haters and to show to you yourself and the world that why you're doing matters. Because basically the, the sort of message that I was going for after all that soul, soul, soul searching was, yeah, not about zebra muscles that I'm going to bring to college, but it's about the resilience. It's about being adaptive. It's about being creative. It's about, you know, advocating for yourself and like making sure that you can like show that value to the outside world. I'm feeling so inspired and motivated and I can't wait to hear your next TED talk. Um, I think the last question that I would have for you is what advice do you have for students who are just starting their college essays and want to know how they can dig more into the why or start that soul searching process? Um, so I actually did a more like rigor soul searching process when I applied um, to business schools. Um, I applied for some deferred programs, got in early. And so they also require to, you to write these like very soul searching things. Um, and so what I would do is I would, in high school, not until my college version, is I would read these prompts. I would write down like in the moment, a bunch of like ideas, just like bullet, 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 bullet. And then when I would drive, because I would live like 45 minutes away from um, school. It's going to kind of sound crazy, but I would literally, um, instead of listening to music, I would just like talk myself through what that essay would look like. And so, for example, Zebra Muscles, right? I had so many iterations. There's so many things and lessons I could have drawn, messages that I'd want to show. But in that 45 minutes, that gave me enough time to um, basically, like, okay, so let's pretend I'm going to write my, you know, my answer to the said response about zebra muscles and just like pretend like I was talking to someone about it or my sister who was always asleep in the back but I'd be like also, I'm gonna tell you about zebra muscles <laughs> it's, it's funny because in when you know people debug their code um there's this sort of like rubber duck or teddy bear that at least like my CS professors would give us and be like okay can you talk through your problems uh to this like <laughs> little stuff animal so whether it's your sister in the back seat whether it's like a stuffed animal just like I found that I <laughs> excuse me I found that I um, digest and think while talking, which is not the best, but it is how I think. And so, yeah, like in those car rides, I would just like talk myself through like what I'm thinking about because I think just sitting down and like writing was so nerve wracking for me. I was like, wait, but it's not going to be perfect. And for some reason, just like talking through it and then being like said one sentence, but no, 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 actually that's not right. Let me try that again. Um, Give me like the flexibility to iterate without feeling like it was sentenced him. Yeah, I definitely think the key takeaway here is like identifying what brainstorming method works best for you. Um, like you've identified talking aloud. For me, it's actually just writing out all my thoughts and actually fleshing them out to outlines. And then I'll just look through and just pick one that I feel like feels the most authentic to myself. So I think it's really just identifying what method works best for you and then really, really leaning into that. Yeah, well, I love your method also. I think everyone's style is different. So there's really no right way, but it's also just really interesting to hear how everyone else works and thinks as well. Um, because again, there's there's no right answer. So yeah, that concludes the video. And thank you so much, Ayushi, for your time. Um, I'm sure uh, all the viewers are going to be super excited to hear your story and will learn so much from your experience. And thank you so much for your advice. And to anyone else watching, if you found this video helpful or enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And I'll also link Ayushi's LinkedIn um, below in case if you want to check her out. Well, thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you in the next video. 